So how do we sort this out? Again, at first blush, based on the report that the radiologist gives uh, on an MRI scan, um, it may be similar among different patients, but there are variables to be taken into consideration. And um, you know, over recent years, there's been an evolution in, in thinking about this. So in the past, the focus has been on you know, how, how far down, by and large, how far down the uh, cerebellum descends. But the size of the foramen magnum, the shape of the foramen magnum, the, uh, those matter. Obviously, if your base of your skull has less space than someone else's where there's more space, then that'll make a difference. If you've got your cerebellar tonsils coming down or you've got uh, a carry malformation and you've got a larger foramen magnum and a larger base of the skull, chances are you tolerate that better than somebody where, where it's smaller and tighter. Also, the angulation or the relationship of the base of the skull to the top of the spinal cord makes a difference. And this especially can be an issue in people who are hypermobile and have EDS or other hypermobility disorders. They can get what's called craniocervical instability, where the angle between the base of the skull and the top of the spine is more narrow than it should be. And that can lead to additional problems. That can lead to pressure or pulling on the brainstem or uh, traction on the brainstem or uh, displacing the brainstem. And um, there's not consensus yet on exactly what measurements are the most important and how those measurements should be made. And again, as I've said, a lot of the focus has been on you know, what the cerebellum is doing, presuming that things are getting pushed on or pulled on. And there's a lot of people who think that what's may be happening in many patients is that the spinal fluid flow is being disrupted. So spinal fluid is fluid that flows within spaces in the brain, it flows around the brain, it flows around the spinal cord. So if there's something going on in the frame and magnum that can interfere with how freely the spinal fluid flows, that can change the pressure. And so our brain floats in spinal fluid. If the pressure of the spinal fluid is higher than it should be, that exerts pressure on our brain. That can cause headaches and that can cause other problems. If the pressure is too low, then that can cause problems. So again, uh, there's concerns that carry malformations or other related issues can in interfere with that flow of cerebral spinal fluid. While we're talking about cerebral spinal fluid, sometimes there are conditions where there's too little cerebral spinal fluid. There may be a leak. So people who are hypermobile can get tears in their dura, and that's the membrane that surrounds the brain and the spinal cord. If that happens in the spine, then there could be a slow leak and fluid could go out and the brain can sag down. So sometimes what looks like a carry malformation or low-lying cerebral or tonsils or whatever we call it, what, what looks like that in an MRI is actually not from a structural problem where the cerebellum is going down further than it should, it's actually that the brain is sinking because there's a spinal fluid leak. So if there's low spinal fluid pressure versus high spinal fluid pressure, that's a different way of treating it. And so you can see how this gets complicated. Um, I mentioned there's questions that come up of how these should be treated. So basically, the question is, should there be surgery for a carry malformation? So traditionally that has involved what we call decompression. So just as it sounds, a neurosurgeon takes out part of the skull at the back of the head and makes a larger space and deals with the carry that way. So that would be a reasonable treatment if the problem was that the cerebellum or part of the cerebellum was taking up more space than it should. However, if the problem is a fluid flow problem, well, that might help, but it might not. It might not help enough. Or, if there's some instability, like craniocervical instability, just doing a decompression may not help and actually may aggravate that tendency towards instability and make it more pronounced. So sometimes 
a different surgery may be needed, like a surgery to stabilize the base of the skull against the spinal cord. Sometimes not a surgery at all. And so it's very complicated. There are additional diagnostic tests, specialized scans, in addition to just a routine MRI, scans that look at the uh, cerebral spinal fluid flow, so-called CINE studies, scans that look at the blood flow, or more importantly, the venous flow, so scans called venograms, which could be MR venograms or CT venograms. Um, that can look at that. Sometimes there's even more invasive tests that measure the, measure the pressure to see if it's too high or too low. But um, it's still a, a work in progress and uh, surgeons and radiologists and neurologists and other specialists are, are trying to better zero in on, on how to treat these, these patients. Um, as I mentioned, these are problems that are often seen in individuals with EDS and related conditions. So as a neurologist, uh, I, I think I, I bring value to my patients and being able to help navigate this situation. Um, you know, I have the expertise to do careful neurologic examinations, to evaluate and review MRI and other radiological scans myself, and to help guide people to the appropriate specialist, be it a neurosurgeon or, or otherwise, or, or figure out other treatment plans.